So this morning we're talking about how to hack government, technologists as policymakers. Uh, I'm Ashkan Sultani, currently the chief technologist at the FTC. Um, I, you might know me from uh, my work with the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. I was one of the reporters that worked on the Snowden documents that brought you that smiley face. Um, and I'm Terrell McSweeney. I'm a commissioner with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, and I'm a, an attorney. I'm not a technologist. Uh, and I've been in the policy space for a long time at both FTC, White House, and DOJ. Um, as you can probably tell by the difference between these pictures, I'm the type of person that really relies on technologists like Ashkan to help me do my job, uh, which is a little bit about what we're going to be talking about today. Just a word about the disclaimer that's at the bottom of this slide. Um, both um, Ashkan and I work for the Federal Trade Commission. Um, so do a lot of other people, and I actually have four other colleagues who are also commissioners, and they don't always agree with everything we say, so we're here talking today about our experiences, and we're speaking sort of individually and not on behalf of the whole entire Trade Commission. Or the government. Or the government. <laughs> uh, so this talk, um, we're going to talk about what is tech policy, um, what are the big debates right now, and why do technologists, you in the audience, why do you guys matter? And what this talk isn't, it's not a te tech talk. Uh, we're not dropping any O'Days. We're talking about some vulnerabilities, but they're, they're, they're the human kind. They're, they're people and process. Um, just to start. Does that work? Is it? No. The internet is not something that you just dump something on. It's not a big truck. It's, it's a series of tubes. And if you don't understand, those tubes can be filled. And if they're filled, when you put your message in, it gets in line. It's going to be delayed by anyone that puts into that tube enormous amounts of material. So this is Senator Ted Stevens, um, and it's a you know his relatively famous quote during the 2006 net neutrality debate, where he's trying to describe the infrastructure of the internet. Um, and we included it just because it sort of underscores our message, which is that uh, people who make laws and who make policy do need to have technical experts that help them understand the technology that they are impacting. And to be fair, he wasn't totally wrong, right? It is kind of tubes. It's more tubes than trucks, for example. So not bad, right? Right. <laughs> Um, so there are a number of policy issues that are hotly debated in D.C. right now. This is kind of a word cloud of, of many of them. Privacy, data security, cross-border data flows, the right to be forgotten. Um, Wassenaar, you have um, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which you guys are probably very intimately familiar with. Um, there's cybersecurity legislation currently on the floor of the Senate. Uh, with data breach and data security. There's a ton of debates. Um, and. Uh, but I want to start here at the FTC uh, because every day you take the lead in making sure that Americans, their hard-earned money, and their privacy are protected, especially when they go online. And these days that's pretty much for everything. Managing our bank accounts, paying our bills, handling everything from medical records to movie tickets, controlling our homes, smart houses from smartphones. Uh, Secret Service does not let me do that, uh, <laughs> but I know other people do. So this is President Obama uh, actually at the Federal Trade Commission earlier this year talking about a lot of the tech policy issues that we at the Trade Commission spend a lot of time on, consumer data privacy, data security, uh, the Internet of Things. and. Um, this was actually kind of really memorable for the FTC. Uh, president Obama was the first president since President Roosevelt to visit the Trade Commission. But I think it really underscores how important a lot of these technology policy debates are right now and how they've risen up uh, literally to the highest levels of, of government. Uh, just to note also, I think it's important to explain that at the Trade Commission, we protect consumers and we're focused on um, practices in the private sector that are impacting them. So that's what we're going to focus on in this talk today. So when I'm talking about consumer privacy, I'm talking about uh, privacy in, uh, as it relates to the commercial space. We're not the part of the government that um, gathers information about people and things like that. That's a different debate, very important one, but we're going to stay out of that for now because it's not in the FTC jurisdiction. And he makes an important point that you guys all know, which is that nearly every part of society now has some technological component. Nearly everything we do is online or, or technically mediated via an app or you know, a com computer of some sort. And that's where I think we play. We, we, we come in as technologists. 
Uh, so just to level set, there's a kind of um, alphabet soup of laws that protect consumer data and privacy in the United States. Uh, sometimes we refer to this as a sector-based approach, and this is uh, just a slide that runs through um, many of those laws. Um, that we protect children under 13 in COPPA. Um, we have uh, special protections for financial information and health information for certain kinds of student records, that's FERPA. Um, we have, uh, obviously, privacy protections in the Telecommunications Act as well. That's the jurisdiction of the FCC, so, uh, and several state laws as well. So, so that's the kind of landscape that we're, that we're operating in um, and the kinds of protections that are out there. And, uh, and then we also have the FTC. And one of the things to think about is, for the most part, um, there aren't a lot of restrictions on what companies, uh, what information companies can gather um, or what, what consumers' data protection practices in law. We have a patchwork, as, as Terrell said, of laws and regulation that essentially achieve that effect, but there's nothing specifically pro prohibiting companies from gathering your information, for example. So the FTC, um, how does this fit into this, uh, this space? Um, the FTC was created in 1914 by President Woodrow Wilson, that's him on the left. It was actually part of um, a policy debate that was really focused on um, trying to combat the economic power of the trust, that's like a, a cartoon about Standard Oil, you know, all that stuff. Um, so it was created because uh, there was a lot of concern about the power that these trusts had in our economy. Um, and that was 100 years ago, but it was given this relatively broad authority to protect consumers from unfair deceptive acts and practices. Um, and that's the next slide. And as Terrell said, <laughs> we're, we're oh, I'll go ahead. You go ahead. So we're, we're kind of, you could think of us as the white hats of, uh, yeah. of government, right? We're here to protect consumers. We're here to promote um, good practices by companies, get them to fix their shit when it's broken. Uh, we're kind of, um, as far as government goes, um, on the consumer side of things. And so the authority that we have, um, we use essentially in a number of ways, and we're gonna spend a little time talking about that today, uh, mostly to um, check to make sure that privacy po um, promises that are being made to consumers are being actually um, adhered to, uh, and that pr consumers are protected from unfair practices, um, especially uh, when it comes to securing their data. And unfair, it took me a while to get, but unfair doesn't mean, you know, hey, that's unfair. And it, there's a specific legal definition of unfairness under FTC law, and that is really important to understand as you try to, or as, as we try to highlight practices that we think uh, might be problematic. There's restrictions like it can't be offset by countervailing benefits. Um, there's uh, likelihood to cause an injury um, or harm in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll, I'll, let, uh, I'll let Terrell explain more about the law. I don't know anything about this. Maybe you know something about this. It has to do with the Federal Trade Commission, and apparently there was a product being marketed uh, in the United States. It was caffeine-laced undergarments. <laughs> the idea was the caffeine in the undergarment, uh, the wearer could lose weight and, and, and have less cellulite. So that... By putting caffeine in your underpants. That seems like a really cool idea. It turns out this product doesn't actually work, which is a bummer. Um, and we, um, <laughs> literally, right? Uh, we at the FTC protect consumers from a bunch of um, products and, and marketing claims uh, for products that don't do what they claim they do, right? That's a really low-tech example. Um, and, uh, you know, we also, um, so we do, that's like our bread and butter, but we also do a lot of high-tech products as well. So, you know, it wasn't just our, our, our undergarments, underpants. Um, consumers in, in, you know, in 1914 were adopting technologies like the phone um, and, and rail. In fact, one of our first cases was uh, against this company uh, that, produced a calculating machine, and we brought in a case uh, alleging that it did not do the claims, and there we had to understand what a calculating machine, an early computer, what the capabilities were and what, um, what claims they were making, and actually understand the technology underlying their claims. And it's always been a part of our work. We, in the, I think, 60s or 70s, for example, would build systems to automatically test 
tar content in cigarettes, right? So this was a um, parallel smoking machine that would just inhale cigarettes and measure the, the ingredients. Um, it became the FTC method. And there, again, we're building technology to measure things, right? If folks remember, like, the Droid Army uh, project that would measure uh, vulnerable libraries and an multiple Android devices in parallel. These are the types of things that we've always kind of been engaged in to help um, measure and contrast and, and, and understand practices in particular spaces. So the FTC at 100 is increasingly engaged in um, looking at technology and high-tech products. Um, this is a, a, gives you a sense of some of the cases that we've had involving uh, huge tech companies in the last five years. And sometimes the FTC is even referred to now as the Federal Technology Commission because of our role increasingly in looking at um, these, the practices of these companies as it relates to the impact that they're having on consumers, especially their privacy and, and their data security. And we're going to step through a couple of these cases, but to start? Uh, so to start, one important thing, and we've been talking about it a little bit, is uh, we have the ability to try to make sure people are um, marketing their products fairly to consumers and not deceiving them. So this case actually um, is currently in litigation, uh, and here the issue is, um, does an unlimited plan that is throttled uh, actually, is that actually an unlimited plan? Um, and our uh, allegation in this case is that it is deceptive to consumers to say that they are getting an unlimited plan if, in fact, they're going to be throttled over certain thresholds. Right, and here we have to understand things like how network routing works, what is congestion-based throttling versus um, just network management, um, you know, what are, for example, um, SS7 and weird networking and GSM protocols that you know people and some some people now in this audience know, but um, obscure te technical underpinnings of old telco uh, telco systems in order to bring this case, right? So companies uh, would make arguments that this is how it needs to be managed, and we would say, for example, if you're capping people at five gigabytes, regardless of network congestion, that might not be congestion throttling, um, and so and, and it becomes a core element of our case. So privacy promises. This is a big piece of what we do on the enforcement side. And the reason we're spending a little time talking about um, a bunch of the FTC enforcement cases is that enforcement is actually one of the strongest tools that we have in our toolbox to help shape policy and practices in the private sector. Uh, Google Buzz, for example, this case involves um, a broken privacy promise, which is um, that uh, that Google made to Gmail users about how they would use Gmail information and whether they would use that um, in a way uh, that was different than the Gmail users um, expected. And so it's, it's relatively important because uh, we, um, we allege that, in fact, uh, the Gmail users couldn't avoid, um, couldn't have anticipated having their information used for Buzz and then didn't have adequate notice to be able to opt out. And we, once, the, once the settlement is reached, the company is often put under order for, for example, Google is under order for 20 years to maintain their privacy policies, uh, sorry, pri privacy promises, and in fact have regular privacy assessments. And we then use that authority to later bring um, other enforcement actions. So you might recall Google was also uh, found circumventing um, Safari browser settings, res basically respawning Safari cookies. Um, and we later then brought an enforcement action with monetary uh, penalties uh, once they're under order. So similarly, Facebook, um, and then, you know, the Facebook case, again, we took a hard look at whether um, the representations that Facebook had made to users about how they could restrict their information were actually true um, and, um, and determined uh, that, that they weren't um, and brought a, brought a case there. This is um, also pretty important because we looked at um, how the retroactive change to how users' information was handled um, actually was deceptive to and unfair to consumers. So um, we looked at a change in policy and, um, and tried to hold Facebook accountable to, for the promises that they had made. And this is one of my first cases. Uh, I was a staff, uh, staff technologist at the time, 2010, and um, there was a lot of technical, kind of technical work that needed to be done. For example, um, we would we allege that 
uh, Facebook apps would have access to more information than uh, what users were told. So you could restrict your information sharing to private, for example, um, via Facebook settings. But as folks in this audience know, via the Facebook API, you could pull a lot more information. You could pull uh, whatever information the user had, had said. So we had to do things like understand the API, run apps to demonstrate, or, or write apps to write, demonstrate and verify our claims. Um, there was a claim regarding deletion of photos. And so there was uh, the need to understand how CDN works, right? So when you delete your face, your photo on Facebook, if you deep link to that photo, it's still available on the caching network because they did not delete the photo off the, you know, off their CDN. Um, there was another uh, uh, case with regards to sharing information, and folks here know how um, advertisers get information via refer headers. So Facebook claimed that they would not share your information with advertisers, but in fact, your Facebook ID and perhaps the page you're on would be sent to advertisers embedded in uh, on the Facebook page because they didn't properly iframe the, the advertisement, et cetera. So a lot of it, the case, the, the findings were, or the, the, the um, case was a legal finding, but we had to essentially techno, uh, technically demonstrate what our claims were with regard to information sharing. If I could just sort of underscore that for a second, I'm a lawyer, not a computer scientist. Um, half the time I might not even understand some of the terminology Ashkan was just using, uh, but when I can work with a technologist who does, they explain it clearly, then it helps inform our mission. So it's like a core part of why this partnership is so important. Uh, Nomi. Um, so this is a relatively recent case. Again, privacy promises. This is a company whose technology allows uh, their, their clients, retailers, to track users as they're coming in and out of their retail locations. And again, we brought a case here uh, because the company said that users, uh, uh, that, that co consumers would have the option to opt out in retail locations that, were, that was using the technology um, and that, would ha um, that they would have notice in the retail locations using the technology, neither of which uh, were happening. So we brought a case saying that was deceptive. And do folks know what this is, the retail tracking? So this is basically promise mode Wi-Fi sniffing, right? Mm -hmm. So you had to, you know, the retailers and malls will install um, essentially access points that are passively monitoring for uh, Wi-Fi or GSM beacons and they will track you, you know, whether you return to the store or where you walk through the mall. And again, tech, there was a lot of technical claims. For example, com a lot of the companies in this space will argue that the information is anonymous. They collect, um, for example, they might collect MAC addresses but they use cryptographic uh, functions to anonymize the, the MAC addresses. And in fact, if you, if you, you guys well know that there hashing the MAC addresses with known hashes, oftentimes it's like six byte um, MAC address. Uh, the first part is essentially the manufacturer code, so the, the space required to actually brute force a hash is um, quite small, right? It's something like two to the 30th. And you can do that on a regular laptop or you can download a rainbow table. So you, we, a lot of the, the argument was that, you know, when companies make claims that this information is anonymous, that we would demonstrate that in fact it's not really, right? The, the current status quo is you can reverse the hash or you can uh, go back to the MAC address. Similarly, you know, with regards to claims about notice, companies would make claims that like, for example, the, um, the tracking only occurred within the, the mall, but as you all know, Wi-Fi signals can traverse, um, you know, past walls, right? So, so the store next door would also, uh, p so visitors to the store next door would also have their information captured by this location tracking technology. So, informing that, um, and, and kind of informing the pros and cons and the and the pitfalls were critical to actually bringing this case. And I think this is where we, as a community, can really, um, really contribute. Finally, Snapchat. This is a case um, that's part of our ongoing effort to make sure that apps are being marketed truthfully to consumers. And in this case, we alleged it was deceptive when the company claimed that uh, messages would disappear forever when in fact it was relatively easy to capture them. We also had um, looked carefully at data security practices and some of the other practices and found that the claims being made were um, also similarly misleading. And this is, this is another, like folks in this community, there was a talk I think in 2013 by the Straws guys about, um, you know, uh, uh, ephemeral apps and how they weren't in fact ephemeral. Um, 
and this is, a, this is an area where this community has contributed quite a lot in research and demonstrating that when companies make privacy and security claims, which is something we want, right? We want privacy-preserving apps, but when they're not true, it actually harms consumers and harms trust in the industry, right? So if you can Snapchat you know, some sensitive photos to someone and they can easily s scrape that information, consumers are effectively harmed because they, they were proceeding or sending those photos under assumption of trust. And so in addition to kind of the deceptive uh, claims, we, uh, deceptive cases, we also bring enforcement actions against companies that um, fail to meet um, reasonable security practices. So one of the cases that I worked on was HTC. For, if folks remember, there was this hubbub around Carrier IQ, which was a kind of a um, telemetry app inside uh, multiple smartphones. The carrier would essentially get the, the OEM to load this um, this uh, kind of logging feature to help understand how people use the phones or monitor the devices. And in fact, in this case, uh, Carrier IQ, sorry, uh, HTC integrated the Carrier IQ system as well as their logger in a, in a way that, for example, broke the Android permissions model. They allowed unsigned code. They, um, uh, the daemon was using an INETD listener bound to essentially the, all interfaces so any other app could also pull information from the daemon. They, like, they enabled debug options in the production code, so it was logging all sorts of things like key, press, key presses and SMS. And so here we made the case that by this poor integration, by not having proper procedure to review code and test um, you know, tests c and doing code signing, that they were not uh, essentially maintaining reasonable practices, right? They broke the Android permission model and would effectively leak information to other apps. And just a word about these security cases. We've been talking before about privacy cases that usually involve some sort of deception or a promise that's made that isn't kept. Um, these security cases, uh, we also use our unfairness authority to bring them, which means essentially, and we talked about this a little bit at the beginning, that we are looking at um, whether consumers are, um, can avoid the, the harm to them um, and whether they are in fact harmed. And that's sort of the, the way we look at it. In the security context, um, that leads us to <clears throat> excuse me, take a look at whether the practices that are being used by the company are reasonable. We don't believe that they have to be, that there's such a thing as perfect security or that what we are expecting here is perfect security. But what we do, do start to enforce here are, are reasonable security uh, measures in place to protect the consumer data that the company has. And that's where the technologists are absolutely vital to our mission because we have to understand the, and have expertise to understand the security practices and procedures that are in place. And we have a number of these apps. This is another case uh, where um, multiple apps, in this case Fandango, you, the ticketing app, and Credit Karma, an app that you can pull um, uh, your credit score, were uh, essentially not cert validating and allowing uh, SSL man in the middle attack, defeating the, the whole purpose of SSL. And so we brought a case against them that, that, that by breaking cert validation, they were in fact um, not engaging in uh, reasonable security practices. Um, and these cases also involve a deception element as well. So promising you're securing something when you're not can be deceptive. Um, and one of the recent cases, TrendNet, which is an IoT camera, folks are probably, this is one of our first IoT cases. Folks are prob probably familiar with this. It was a kind of a webcam that allowed um, uh, essentially users to, and they would, they would advertise that it could be used to monitor your baby or it could be, as you, could be used in uh, banking environments. It was a secure camera, except the secure view functionality um, allowed any user that could pull the IP address of the camera to pull the video feed, even if the user had marked the video as private, right? And this is one of these cases where, again, um, the, the understanding, for example, how to connect and how, uh, you know, the, the network, this was a really easy one. You could direct, connect directly to the camera, but some of the newer cams, for example, will have either bad defaults or the way they do um, port negotiation uh, will allow any, 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 any attacker to pull video for a number of cameras um, without, uh, without even needing to go to the admin interface. And so these IoT cases are really interesting for us because we're trying to understand this space. There's been a number of talks here informing some of the problems in IoT and I think um, this is a critical area for us. And just a word about the harm in this case. Um, so, you know, it's obvious if the harm is uh, credit card information, financial information, that kind of thing. Here the harm, though, is exposing video feeds from people's homes to the public internet. Um, and, and we think that's a violation of privacy that is deeply harmful. 
Yeah, I think in, in the case there were examples of people uh, in various states of undress and engaged in sexual activity, which we would argue is somewhat harmful. Uh, if if uh, you know an attacker can review that, or, or any not even an attacker in this case, someone can punch an IP address in their camera and, and watch that feed. And then the last case we'll talk about um, is a case called Designerware. This is one of the, an older case. I didn't actually work on this case, but it was essentially. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I got that mixed up. The nudity was in this case, not the earlier case. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, this was a, a essentially a rat, right? So um, designer wears made software that allowed rent to own companies uh, to monitor devices that they uh, rented to consumers, and so the co the software could. Uh, be enabled to monitor keystrokes, take screenshots every two minutes, take web camera shots every two minutes, and, uh, and there was no notice to consumers. And so we uh, argued that this was an unreasonable practice, especially that, as I said, um, in some cases, uh, you know, photos of pictures of children, individuals not fully clothed, and couples engaged in sexual activity were captured by uh, the software. And this was like for people that were late on their payments, right? This is like uh, the, the, the companies, the rent to own companies would enable this for people that were late on payments and would capture this data without the users knowing. So again, unfair and deceptive, harmful to consumers because it's exposing their, them to things that they can't avoid, they're not aware of, and um, they're really uh, very vulnerable if your computer is turning on and taking you know, screenshots, sort of like Mr. Robot, um, That's right. <laughs> you know, uh, of, your, of your home or, or your personal life. And, this, and I just want to highlight, so this is just one of, you know, we just covered a, a, a few of our cases, but there are a ton that are very technical and informed by this community. We've, we've brought cases against companies using flash cookies to circumvent browser settings and privacy controls. We recently brought a case against a, um, a mobile app that had a Bitcoin miner enabled in it that would essentially, um, kind of like SETI at home, would use your, your phone to mine Bitcoins when you were not um, when you are not using the phone. We've brought cases against companies using CSS history sniffing, which is again an academic paper that informed us of this uh, practice, but we then verify and, uh, and demonstrate uh, the, the problem ourselves. But um, again, a very technical concept. And then we have a number of cases in data security. But in addition to enforcement, yeah, so we've been talking about our big stick, which is our enforcement cases, and there's a bunch more of them, as Ashkan just said, so um, we can provide that information for you, and it's on our, our websites. But we also shape policy and the public policy debates in a variety of other ways. Um, we convene workshops, for example. We've been very focused on the Internet of Things. Um, we think the innovation and the potential in this space is absolutely terrific for consumers. But as a bunch of the folks in this room know, and as, as you know, it's been demonstrated throughout DEF CON this year and last year, there are a lot of potential pitfalls and vulnerabilities in these products. So we're looking carefully at that. We're looking at data discrimination. We're looking at health and fitness wearables and some of the practices there that are impacting consumers. Again, um, pay, uh, if you're generating your own health information and sharing it, it's not HIPAA protected. Um, and a lot of people may not totally understand that. So we're trying to understand how that information is being collected and shared. And, and cross-device tracking. We're also doing a workshop this in November on cross-device <coughs> tracking. Do folks know what this is? Cross-device tracking. Hands. It's an industry term. It's essentially advertisers want to know, for example, when you see an ad on your mobile device and you later purchase it on your tablet or on your home computer, that it, you're the same user and they can attribute the impression or the conversion correctly, right? But the technology behind it is quite interesting, and so we're having a workshop to kind of discuss some of the the concerns and some of the tech, you know, some of the um, consumer notice and some of the choice. Um, functionality. For example, the, you know, the technology works either through logged in services, so you could be logged into you know, one of the big companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and they're able to know you're the same user. But for, for um, a good portion of the practice, uh, a lot of companies will try to behaviorally model that two devices are related. So you might have a burner phone and you might have your regular phone and you try to keep those uh, separate, but in fact the technology will try to fingerprint and then identify that the same phone uh, is connecting from the same location, or the two phones are connecting from the same location, or maybe they visit the same websites, and it's using browser fingerprinting or some sort of um, behavioral correlation that they, statistical correlation. Um, one of the more interesting technologies, for example, is um, something that might resonate uh, in the bad BIOS crowd. One company might use um, audio beacons, uh, you know, subsonic audio beacons that aren't, we can't hear, 
but you know, one phone will, the ad library in one phone will emit this pulse and an ad library in the other phone will pick up um, that these two phones are in proximity to each other and then they will link that together. And so that's a current practice um, and something we want to learn more about. Uh, so we also um, put out material. Uh, I'm really excited right now about our Start With Security initiative. We're going to be convening workshops around the country starting in the fall, but we've already released a report uh, called Start With Security. It's on our website. Um, if this is your field, I encourage you to take a look at it. And it's based on the more than 50 cases that we've brought in this space and really um, gets into sort of uh, lessons learned and best practices that we're drawing from our enforcement efforts. Uh, so yeah, so one's happening September 9th and the other's happening September 5th in Austin. Um, we're trying to bring startups and researchers like yourself and uh, you know, uh, VCs and others together to say how can we think about security from the get-go? How can we prioritize and what are those best practices? Um, I also have a kind of a tech FTC blog and there we, or there I try to highlight um, some of the more technical best practices or some of the technical concerns in the space. And again, it's very much informed by this community um, recently, you know, and, and they tend to be me or other um, techno technical lawyers at the FTC. There are actually quite a few. Uh, this is a blog post on the principle of least privilege and how to access APIs securely. Um, so there's a bunch of work that we're trying to do in addition to enforcement to inform the community and what should be best practices. And again, it's very much informed by the work you, you all do as well. Uh, we also have been really excited to use the America Competes Act to run contests to harness the uh, technical know-how of this community and others. Um, so this week uh, we've actually been running our um, Humanity Strikes Back contest, which is helping us um, bring new tools to consumers to block robocalls and then report them into a crowdsourced honeypot. I'm pretty excited about this contest. It builds on our effort here last year, which was called Zapping Rachel. Rachel is that annoying robot customer service voice, like, I'm Rachel from customer service. Um, this is really important to us because uh, we operate the do not call list, but we get about 170,000 complaints a month about robocalls from people who are on the do not call us. It's really hard for us to try to um, you know, enforce our laws and protect people from these really annoying calls. So we're trying to develop new tools, harness new technology, so that uh, not only will help us with our enforcement effort, but also give consumers new tools. So yeah. contests are awesome. And the contest will be announced today at two here at mm -hmm. the award ceremony. And this is a great example of this need that um, this harmony between technology and law, right? So a lot of what happens in policy is the lawyers are like, go, you know, technology will fix it. And us our techs are like, someone should make a law against that, right? But in fact, you need the two working together, right? So we have the do not call list, but as we know, robocalls can, you know, jump on PBXs and make, make calls from any number and they're hard to do sender reputation, right? So what are some other tools we can, we can employ to essentially, um, protect consumers or, or kind of uh, enact the do not call uh, mission, which is to protect consumers from robocalls. Um, we also have, I'm happy to announce, we're kicking off a Office of Technology Research. And this is essentially an in-house research um, group that um, I'm helping put together. Uh, we actually have some interns in the, in the audience here that managed to wake up at 10, nice work. Um, uh, and they're doing you know, ongoing kind of proactive research into emerging technologies, right? So we're, we're black boxing things ourselves. We're poking at things. We're looking for vulnerabilities. We're looking at data issues. We're looking at data discriminations. Some of the topics of interest for me personally are, you know, the Internet of Things, obviously, connected cars, which is a hot issue, and this idea of uh, algorithmic transparency. And by that I mean, um, so uh, some of my past work I've helped highlight companies charging different prices to people based on your zip code or based on some uh, refer headers or what cookies you might have. Um, one way I like to send the message home is, is you know, how many folks here in the audience use some sort of mapping software, you know, Google Maps or Bing or whatever else, right? Almost everyone. But how many have, uh, how, how many actually know whether you're being served the best routes, right? So we assume you know the system is routing us based on um, shortest distance or traffic or congestion. But how do you know it's not routing you in front of a storefront or a billboard the company receives kickbacks for? We don't, right? We don't have a way to look into algorithms currently um, and know what are the biases inherent. And so driving might you know might 
Um, driving is one factor, but uh, there's issues with regards to discrimination and gender biases and a lot of um, kind of problematic areas in society that, that algorithms can help um, either directly or inadvertently um, <coughs> contribute to bad practices, right, or biased practices. And so that's an area that I'm very interested in, in, in black boxing. And can I just, like, a, a word about this um, OTRI office, which I think is really, really important. And, and in fact, Ashkan's role and, and the role of technologists at the FTC. What we see is increasingly the need for, for us to protect consumers in an increasingly wired and connected world. We need to have our own technologists helping inform our law enforcement and policy mission. And so we're expanding the role that the technologists are playing, and I think it is vitally important so that we can understand uh, exactly what's happening in the marketplace and keep up with a very dynamic and exciting, innovative marketplace. And we've kind of hogged the stage about the FTC's work, right? So this is all about you know what we're doing now at the FTC, but there are a ton of because the FTC rocks. That's true Sorry. too. But there's a ton of other technical debates that are currently going on in DC that a lot of us are not engaged on, but they're in fact critically important to technology or have uh, have a, require a deep understanding of technology to facilitate, right? So data security, export controls, we talked about a bunch of them, drones, student privacy, mm -hmm. patents, I think this was your slide. Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> sorry, you're I doing a really in. good job uh, with it. Student privacy, patents, facial recognition trolls. Um, these, are, these are all really important tech policy debates. Uh, the FTC plays a role in them and uh, and so do a lot of other government agencies, and so is Congress, and uh, we are here to make a plug for you to bring your technical know-how into that debate and have a voice in it as well, because we think having technologists at the table is absolutely vital to getting these policies right. That's right, and so this is Call of Duty, it's really fun, but this is another Call of Duty, right? This is actually a lot more fun, right? Telling a bunch of high-powered policymakers that their understanding of the world is completely wrong is really, Great, actually, it's, it's quite fun. I've done it, I've testified a few times. But it's also critical, right? So otherwise, if we're not engaged in these debates, if we're not trying to inform how things work and what the policy impact of, the, uh, of the, the laws that will be proposed are, then people that don't have any technical back background or brag about the fa fact that they don't use email or you have a flip phone. There's, you know, in Congress there's a flip phone caucus. And I don't want to pick on particular members, but there are people that say, like, we don't need to know about technology to make the right law. We think the internet should work like this, or we think technology should work like this. And if we don't actually engage and inform this debate, other people will make these laws that affect us, affect you, without any, uh, without any inf kind of understanding of the underlying uh, technical impact. And so, so, main takeaways, in case you haven't missed it, uh, we need your help. Your work has uh, a lot of impact on what we do, and it matters. Uh, and we want you to come help us. We've been talking a little bit about some of the more formal ways we engage, but I also want to put a plug in for just coming in and having a brown bag and talking to us about your research. Um, we, we do that regularly at the FTC, and it's really, really helpful. Yeah, so if you want to contact us, ftc.gov slash tech is my blog. Um, tech at FTC, at, uh, tech at FTC at ftc.gov is also how you can reach me. If you're coming to DC and you want to talk about uh, if you want to give a presentation of, of something that we might be interested in, shoot me a line. Um, check out the Office of Technology Research, OTRI. In fact, we are hiring, right? We're, we're trying to bring, we're, we're currently looking for white hat researchers, research coordinators, people to do um, research in-house in our Office of Technology Research. So I urge you to get, either email me or check out the USA Jobs posting um, under FTC. It's a horrible website, so you might want to actually just email me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, and uh, but but you can come work, and you know I won't I won't argue. It's not necessarily the most glamorous job. There's a bunch of you know a bunch of constraints, but again, it's a tour of duty, right? So if, just if you come for one or two years and help work on some of these issues and help do research, and you get to work on pretty much really fun stuff, right? You can poke apart any new technology and then make policy recommendations, right? So in addition to like poking apart stuff, you can say, well, you know what? This is how things should work, right? So you can make suggestions for policy and how to how companies might want to implement or, or, or just ideas, right? So um, you can creative solutions to these problems. Um, so it's, it's pretty fun even though, you know, it's government and uh, your friends will make fun of you at, at Spot the Fed. Um, <laughs> so that's our talk. Um, we, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I'm also happy to kind of uh, talk about a few tips and tricks on what I've found with regards to talking to policymakers. So it's not always 
Um, I think a lot of it is, is uh, being able to communicate things uh, effectively and something that our, our audience, not, not that we don't do a good job of, but there's a particular way you need to engage policymakers that I've found to be particularly effective. So I'm happy to talk about some of those trips and tricks, uh, whatever you guys want. So um, there's going to be a mic going around if anyone has a question. Uh, raise your hand, otherwise uh, I can ramble on for another 10 minutes. All right, so uh, right here, fourth row. Good morning, thank you for coming. Um, one of the big stumbling blocks in consumer privacy right now is how to de do demonstrable, cognizable privacy harms, and that's been a stumbling block for the private plaintiff's bar, um, whereas in the enforcement actions you mentioned, the commission doesn't have to show actual harm to consumers. And I was wondering if you could speak to the commission's efforts, if any, to bridge that gap or provide any sort of guidance or assistance to private plaintiffs who do have to show actual harm to themselves. Yeah, I mean, this is a really important question. And, and as you point out, um, you know, we continue to use our authority to really try to uh, make sure that privacy promises that are being made are being adhered to. Um, but I, you know, I think again, I would underscore the fact that uh, we really look at the kinds of information um, that are exposed, for example, in data security cases, um, and and look uh, very carefully at um, the the promises and commitments that were made, and and um, whether they were adhered to or whether people were misled. And it's important to to stress that. There are currently no baseline privacy laws in the U.S., right? There's currently some bills uh, to, to provide those laws, but right now um, a lot of the issue, if companies say they want to, you know, pwn you in some way and they say it clearly and consumers understand, for the most part with the exception of, uh, you know, if you can demonstrate harm or there are other concerns, they get to do that, right? And that's part of the issue is the way the policy is written. And that might change over time as people's understanding of privacy and its impact. Uh, Changes, but right now, uh, you know, a lot of our authority is based on this unfair and deceptive, which we've been trying to use to protect consumers. But um, you know, the laws, you know, the laws are different than they are in Europe, for example. Fifth row. Yeah, my question is, uh, and you guys have done a great job of explaining the cases and why it matters. What happens to the companies whenever they're found to be um, in violation? So, uh, so we, we generally, in these um, consent orders we've been talking about, have the company under 20-year order. Uh, they contain these two-year independent audits and requirements to have privacy and security policies. Um, so as a part of that process, um, we can hold them in contempt if they're in violation um, and, and have actually done that. Right, and, and we can also say stop doing, what, you know, stop doing that, that's bad, or we can like, find them as well depending on the type of issue. So yeah. we, we can say like, if there are particular practices that are problematic, a lot of our, you know, a lot of our other cases are like fly-by-night scammers, so people that you know, uh, scam your grandmother out of you know, her savings, we go after those companies and shut them down as well. So we have a bunch of different authorities, and it's pretty fun, I will say. We can also, um, one of our authorities, and it comes up more in the scamming space, is we can get consumers' money back. So um, uh, in our cramming, mobile cramming cases, for example, um, in in-app purchases for kids that were misleading, we got um, hundreds of millions of dollars for consumers that goes directly back to consumers in the form of redress, which is like a check in the mail. Uh, there's some questions over here, too. Yeah. Maybe um, uh, speak loudly, and I'll repeat your question. How about that? Oh, actually, there's one with the mic right there. Oh, there's one with the mic right there. Sorry. I'm Hi. Um, can you detail the process of what happens when a, a tech policy law comes in, like the um, SOPA, TPP, CISA, mm -hmm. when a policymaker is more or less out of their depth? Um, how are they getting that technical information in order to make an informed decision? Sure. So, uh, you know, it's definitely not the, you know, the schoolhouse rock, how a bill becomes a law, right? There's a lot of, some, I, I will say some policymakers have very technically adept staff, right? So there's folks in Congress that are, um, have really, you know, CS uh, majors in, in Congress or their staff does, but some don't, right? And some will, will you know, oftentimes, um, and that this goes into some of the points I wouldn't make, oftentimes um, they won't, they, they don't know what they don't know, and in fact they don't care, right? Because even though these are important issues, so are starving children and, you know, uh, nuclear holocaust and whatever else, right? So um, there are a lot of issues in Congress, and so to make this stuff uh, kind of tractable or important, you have to highlight what are those critical points and, and make sure that, that 
in the do- talking points, in the debates, the, the point is being made, right? So if it's car security, people have to demonstrate that it is in fact an issue and people should consider automobile safety in addition to uh, you know, enhan- uh, increasing jobs, for example, right? And so, um, I, so can I, I jump in yeah. as a non-technical policymaker? Um, you know, I think when you're talking to us, uh, metaphors matter, images are good, pictures are good, acronyms are bad, we don't understand them anyway, you know. So you have to really kind of back out a little bit and, um, and sort of uh, speak plain English, uh, use pictures and diagrams and try to, and try to make it real. Um, at, right at the beginning, and then get technical. That's right. good. Right, and so that's. I'm going to just jump in through a couple of these points. So don't assume your uh, audience knows what the hell you're talking about. They'll just nod, and they, they, you know, in the same way that you guys saw all those acronyms, CFA and and COPPA, and, and you just nodded. Don't assume mm-hmm. that the people you're talking to even know what TCP/IP is, or or right. what uh, HTTP is, or any of these ports. You have to find. Um, you, you you have to always back kind of back and then go forward. But also uh, don't make us feel dumb for not right, knowing. Right. Uh, definitely don't, like, don't condescend. Um, metaphors are critical and metaphors both, so metaphor is this really powerful tool, right, because you can help someone um, understand the concept, but the metaphor has to be, uh, has to be um, intact, right? So as you say, like, it's more like a phone call than any, uh, a postal mail, right? As you start, if the thing in fact is stored forward, um, then maybe it's not like a phone call, right? Maybe it's cached, right? So you have to make sure that you pick a metaphor that's maintained, but also it helps a lot even to just do a little bit of homework on what the law is around the previous metaphor, right? So, if, so, so uh, law often works on precedent. So there's a law regarding um, phone calls and, and wiretapping, right? So if you understand those laws, then you can use the metaphor uh, and build on it in a way that uh, resonates with the person who's working on the law. Um, don't, so we have a tendency, I have a tendency to like make sure that you know every freaking detail about the thing and all my findings, right? Realize that again, people have limited time and you want to start with the crux, right? I, I got this a little bit from my work as a journalist as well, which is what resonates with people and what is the turning point that, that this decision uh, hinges on, right? So if, if it's policy regarding um, where data is stored and international borders, um, First focus on just that piece, not the transits and not uh, all the other details, and then expand, right? Because again, you need to like hit home with the one, one piece and not go into too much detail because otherwise you'll lose your audience. And then finally just be, um, be patient, right? Like a lot, of, a, a lot of the issue, I think a lot of like, so this, this video, the one we started with uh, Ted Stevens was kind of funny, but a, a lot of what happened there, and I, I feel bad because we contributed to it, a lot of what happens there is now the technical debate doesn't happen on the floor, on the Senate floor. People are not willing to engage in uh, technical conversation because they don't want to feel like noobs or get made fun of uh, for, for, for saying something wrong. And so it's a lot of our, you know, it's a lot of this community's work to say, like, these are important issues. Here, I'll help you understand. I'll help you bring you along. You're not dumb for understanding it. In the same way that you guys aren't dumb for understanding, for not understanding the law when, you know, your lawyer starts giving you a bunch of acronyms and, and, and your eyes glaze over it. At least it does for me, right? So we, we have to have that same level of respect and, and patience as well. Hi. Um, I don't want you to take it as a personal attack. Sure. But I think it's important for uh, (laughs) full disclosure. Uh, Ashkar, I assume that you uh, were, you know, going through procurement when you received your uh, position at the FTC. However, Terrell, if I understand correctly, Terrell, that's okay. As Mm -hmm. as uh, as a uh, a commissioner, you are an appointee, right? Yes. So at least you have a perceived alliance that would allow you, uh, that, you know, people would think that you would make decisions, uh, you know, of prioritizing what to investigate and so forth uh, based on, you know, whoever appointed you. Uh, Even, you know, maybe fire Ashkar if he, uh, you know, voiced opinions that you don't fully agree with where you want to take. Can you address that a little bit? Whether I'm in a fire ash gun? <laughs> I'm not, just to be clear. Uh, so I, I think that the point um, is, um, is, is a really cool one, actually, because you're talking about a little bit about how our government works, which is that uh, people who are political hacks, um, well, 
that's pejorative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People who are political right. <laughs> um, uh, are deeply engaged in making very important policy choices, um, and uh, hopefully we are using experts to help us do that. I am definitely political. I'm appointed by President Obama. I'm actually filling a Democratic seat on the commission. Uh, the way we're set up is it's uh, two Republicans, two Democrats, and a chair who's appointed by the president. So there's no question that there, there's sort of a, a divide there that's along some sort of political and partisan philosophy, right? Um, and that does reflect a little bit. We don't always agree. For example, sometimes three of us agree and two of us don't or something like that. Um, and we try to explain where the differences are. Uh, but all of us are really committed to using experts. So I would, I would say also we use economic experts, we use technical experts, and it's really, really important part of our, our work. And, and just to tell, and we're out of time, but just to uh, jump in, this is actually, so there's political agendas for sure, and there's, this is how government works, but you can't, under, you can't underestimate the power of, like, of truth or information. Yeah. If you can demonstrate that you can pop a system, or if you can demonstrate that the information is accessible, or if you can essentially use science to prove a point, then the politicians or the people with an agenda have to ignore you or, or silence you. But basically highlighting uh, kind of realities of the world, and at least in the security world, are, are very powerful and kind of go above the politics, right? Even if you're, you know, state of security is a kind of a bipartisan issue, which is great. Like, nobody wants to get popped in Congress, right? That's the worst uh, thing for them, right? They, they do all sorts of sketchy stuff. Um, and so you might find that uh, by highlighting and just kind of trying to speak the truth and then working with the press or working with uh, people to highlight these issues and shine the light, you can kind of cut through a little bit of that political bullshit. Sweet. I think that's our talk. We're out of time. Thank you very much for getting up early and coming. Yeah.